In this class, we'll be looking at the topic of personal sin, which as St. Augustine defines it is aversio adeo et conversio ad creaturas, meaning turning away from God and turning towards creatures. And we'll be looking at this topic under these six headings. Personal sin first, how is an offense against God? Divisions of sin, conditions for mortal sins, effects of mortal and venial sins, sins against the Holy Spirit, and finally, we'll look at temptations which lead to sin. Personal sin and offense against God. And personal sin, we we'll define it as, as, as any utterance deed or desire contrary to God's law. We use the word personal sin to distinguish it from original sin, which is the sin of Adam and Eve, of our first parents. And the effects of original sin, everybody inherits it, and is for people, personal, original sin is a state that everyone um, is in when one is born, whereas personal sin is an act, it's not a state, but an act that people carry out. And that personal sin, as we said, is not just um, any action, but any utterance, any deed or desire contrary to God's law. And two aspects you could say are highlighted in this definition. First of all, and that, that personal sin, every personal sin involves a human act. What's a human act? A human act is a free act carried out with sufficient advertence and consent. Sufficient advertence means I, that one knows what one is doing. One is aware, one has advertent. And consent is that consent of the will that one wants to do what one is doing. If there if one knows what one is doing for, and but one does not want to do it, for example, in a case where a person is forced to do something under pressure and the person does it against his will, then it's not a human act. If the person is doing it, doing it willfully, the kind of an act willfully, but is not aware of what one is doing. For example, in the case where someone is sleepwalking and is not fully aware or is intoxicated, and the person is acting freely, but the person does not have a sufficient awareness or advertence of what one is doing. So, for that to be a human act, one has to know what one is doing and one needs to want to do the consent of the will. The second aspect of um, personal sin is that not just it has to be a human act. But it also has to be contrary to God's law. In more general terms, it's true that it can be affirmed that any human act opposed to the moral law and therefore opposed to right reason or to human, civil or ecclesiastical or civil law is a sin. It's important to keep this in mind that uh, when one sins, at times it's not that one says, now nah, I want to offend God's law. It may be that one uh, carries out an act that he knows that one that it is wrong. Maybe it's wrong in the civil ambit, or it's wrong in human ambit, or ecclesiastical law, and then it will also apply. A good analogy to keep it in mind is to say, well, uh, when children, uh, uh, children fight, maybe children in the home, brother and sister, siblings, they, they fight, and they have they sinned against the parents directly? No. Will the parents be happy to see them fighting? No. And so, that when those siblings fight, they sin against the parents because they're carrying out an act that maybe doesn't affect the parents directly, but they know that it goes against the will of the parents. And the same way is when we say that something is contrary to God's law, it does not mean that God may have explicitly stated it. It's enough to say that, well, this goes against the will of God in this matter, and one commits a sin. And that will of God at times is not expressed explicitly. But then they express explicitly in a just human law, in a just civil law, or in a just ecclesiastical law. At the beginning of this class, we gave that classical definition of St. Augustine by saying that, well, sin is adversio adio et conversio ad creaturas. And St. Augustine would add something else. He would say that, that sin, I mean, one sin that is, it describes, uh, is described it as love of oneself to the point of despising God. That again, and that's another small aspect that is good to keep very much in mind. That when a person sins, sometimes when we commit personal sin, uh, we commit out of a desire for a lesser good, not ordered according to the rule of virtue. 
many times people don't say, well, okay, now I want to offend God. I want to do. I want to. I want evil in itself. Now most sins, or you could say all sins, that there is certain good that the person wants out of that action. Okay. And maybe, for example, when a student cheats in an exam. What he wants is not just the pleasure of cheating, but what he wants generally is, we say, is the, 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 to pass the exam, the good of passing that exam. But he does it, so it was, he chooses that good of passing the exam over and above the good, which is the greater good of being honest. When a person commits uh, adultery, he seeks the pleasure of that adulterous act. And at that moment, for him or her, that uh, pleasure and that sexual pleasure, the person, which is good, which is a good pleasure, but the person sees it, or good in some context as well, the person sees that good as great or greater than that, uh, the good of being faithful to one's spouse. And maybe in the case of the adultery, more specifically, what is even worse is that, of course, that, that good that the person is going for, that good or that sexual pleasure, the person Six it in a disordered way because it will only be illicit when in marriage. When a person steals from another person, he wants the good of whatever he's going to take to the money or the good he's going to collect, uh, and he wants it over and above the good of being honest. And in every single so in every sin that a person that a person commits, where one chooses a lesser good, uh, which is not ordered according to the rule of virtue. And in one exchanges in that way, a limited good for God, who is the infinite good. Especially when one sins, particularly in something that one knows that, well, I'm going against God's will. And maybe I want, and then maybe honors, pleasure, um, goods. And I, I prefer this good and the good of God himself, who is the highest good. Now we we'll look at the divisions of sin. And... There are many divisions. Uh, uh, there's the term we've already seen between personal sin and original sin. There's a division between actual sin and habitual sin. Actual sin is when I mean, a particular act, uh, sinful, individual sinful actions. Whereas habitual sin is to be in the state of sin. There's also the division where we can classify sins according to who is offended. As sins against God, Sins against one's neighbor, sins against oneself. Then there are external sins that have external manifestations and internal sins when it's just an internal disorder desire that one consents to. Then there's what they call informal and material sin. In formal sin that the person wants to commit the sin, material sin that the person does, carries out a sinful act but the person does not know that it is sinful uh, between formal and material. For example, maybe a person that doesn't know that um, that's copying in exams is um, wrong and because maybe where he grew up they always been copying in exams so he copies in exams and um, he doesn't know he's carrying out a sinful action even though materially it's sinful and so the difference between formal and material has to do more with with um, the person being uh, formally wanting to commit a sin being aware that they're committing a sin then there's division of between ignorance, the sins of ignorance, sins of weakness, and sins of malice. And then there's carnal and spiritual sins. And then there's there are sins of commission that one carries out a positive act. And sins of omission. That one omits to carry out something that one has the duty to, to do. But the most important division is the division between mortal and venial sin. And that's what we are going to focus on in the rest of this class. For there to be mortal sin, there are three conditions that have to be fulfilled. First of all, there has to be grave matter. And this means that the moral object of the action carried out is gravely contrary to God's law. Now, the action that the moral object is the action that is carried out. It is something that is gravely, gravely contrary to God's law. Most sins against the sixth commandment. As the thou shalt not commit adultery, and since they have to do with the one's capacity to love, it usually constitutes grave matter. Also, many sins against the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill, are grave matter, because as a um, homicide, euthanasia, abortion, are grave matter. 
But also a deep-seated hatred also, which falls under the sixth commandment, fifth commandment, sorry, is also a grave matter. When we have one has and an consents to a deep-seated hatred towards someone. Also, you can have a grave matter uh, depending on the amount. For example, in the seventh commandment, if one takes a reasonable amount of money that is substantial, then it then that matter is grave. But you can also have it could also be light if the amount stolen or who is stolen from and does not cause grave damage. Then, well, the second condition is full knowledge, yeah? full knowledge or advertence, or full advertence, which means that one knows that the action being carried out is sinful, and one knows that it's contrary to God's law, and that's with full knowledge. And then, the third condition is that there has to be deliberate or perfect consent of the will, which means that one openly desires the action, knowing that it's contrary to God's law. There may be an imperfect conscience when the consent, sorry, when the person is not uh, is not fully decided, or maybe if the person is not act is acting partially under duress, uh, maybe the person has been pressured or threatened, and so the person does not is not does not fully consent, uh, deliberately consent to carry out that action. There may also be partial uh, knowledge. Now maybe the person, I think this is contrary to God's law, but I'm not really sure. And so there's no full knowledge, there's partial knowledge or partial advertence. Yeah. Um, and so uh, in those cases where there's partial knowledge or there's partial consent, sin, even though there's grave matter, those sins will be venial sins and not mortal sins. In fact, in the case where there is no knowledge, not now a partial knowledge, there's no knowledge that what the person thinks that he's doing is good, whereas uh, is actually or indifferent, whereas it's actually bad, even though there's grave matter and there's full consent, when there's no knowledge or there's no consent at all, then there will be no sin, as we saw, uh, because it's not be a human act in the first place, and there will be no sin at all. On the, there will be no formal sin on the part of the person, and the person will not be responsible for those actions, even though there, could, there will be material sin, because it's something bad, but the person is not aware, and so the person is not culpable or punishable for those things because there is no knowledge or there is no consent. What are the effects of mortal sin? Uh, the, first of all, there is that loss of charity and the loss or privation of sanctifying grace. That when one sins, one loses the, the state of grace. Secondly, one loses that union with the mystical body, which is the church, and the person becomes like a sick member. Thirdly, one loses the merits that one has acquired, the merits which are so the merits of the good actions that one has carried out in the past. One loses those merits and is unable to gain new ones. That when one carries out good actions afterwards, after committing a mortal sin, one is not able to, to acquire new merits and loses the ones of the past. But the one becomes subject to the slavery of the devil eh, and of evil. Uh, if one finds it difficult to do good when one has committed a mortal sin. And then also that natural desire for doing good is diminished. And then finally that disorder enters one's powers and affection. Uh, one, if you say, that darkness of uh, within one's powers and affection. What are the effects of venial sin? Now, venial sin, unlike mortal sin, uh, does not remove the state of grace. One does not remove the state of grace, but it, it, one weakens in charity. And it manifests a certain disordered affection for created goods. Now, one becomes more uh, inclined towards created goods and less towards God. And the venial sins impede and make it difficult for the soul to progress in the exercise of virtue. And for that reason, just like the venial sin also merits temporal punishment. That one has to redo or undo that disorder that has been put, that has come to the affection. And then finally, of course, a deliberate venial sin disposes one to commit mortal sin. One may say, well, let me commit this venial sin that is a small thing. But the problem with venial sins is that they accumulate. They are like, you know, the specks or small stains on a, on a white cloth. And if there are many of them over time, that cloth really becomes dirty. And, it is, and 
and which is like that mortal sin. It predisposes one to commit a mortal sin. We just like this image that we have here uh, shows that one venial sin, one says, well, just once it could it won't hurt, just a small thing, and it leads to another and another and another and another until one well is hit by a big one, which is that mortal sin. So they, they dispose the soul to commit mortal sin. Now we're going to look at the seven capital sins. In the seven capital sins, um, uh, what traditionally classified all the sins, but when sin begets sin, when one uh, commits sins, then one little by little forms, you could say, more stable habits uh, or vices, which have been classified over time as the seven capital vices or the seven capital sins. And they are uh, not in any particular order. Anger, pride, greed, gluttony, sloth or laziness, envy and lust. And of course the mother of all of them is that sin of pride which is in the middle there uh, which shows an excessive love for oneself over and above others and over and above God. That pride that puts oneself always in the middle. Creating structures of sin. But before that we, to, we also have in mind that we cooperate in other sins when we freely help people to commit sin. Not just when I carry out a sin, but one can cooperate and one can be responsible for that sin, even though it's not a, it's not, I'm not the one committing that sin. When I help someone to commit a sin, maybe by helping the person to get the tools, maybe someone who supplies the, the gun for someone to go and kill somebody, or the tools in that to break into a house. Uh, when we freely help them and uh, people to commit sin, when um, by helping them, by ordering them, by commanding the person to go and commit a sin, or by advising someone, by giving the person wrong advice, when the person comes and says, well, I don't know what to do, and then we give him the advice that includes carrying out a sinful act. One also commits um, sin by incorporating the sin of others by praising or approving them. Okay. Or, and unfortunately, at times this happens a lot, maybe on social media, at times too, when maybe in a class situation, some people praise or applaud the certain actions that are wrong. And that way they are encouraging the people to carry out those things and cooperating in those things because they show their approval. But also committing by not disclosing or not um, stopping um, disclosing the sin that someone has committed when we have the obligation to do, to, to do so. Or not stopping someone uh, when we have the obligation to do so. Uh, or when one protects someone who has committed a sin from punishment. Also, um, sin also is begotten, um, as we saw with the capital sins, when we, um, and eventually can lead to structures of sin. What are structures of sin? They are societal situations that go against God's law and make it difficult to do good. For example, racism. It's a structure of sin, a structure that, that discriminates against people uh, because of their color or their race. Or a corrupt social system, a, a place where uh, in order to get uh, your privilege, you have to pay a bribe or do something extraordinary. Or in certain instances, maybe in a society, there are some laws that are unjust uh, or discriminatory. And it makes it difficult for one to obey God's law or to do the good. Those are structures of sin. Then, uh, the bigger question many people ask when we look at this topic, which are um, the sins against the Holy Spirit, so-called sins against the Holy Spirit, where uh, in the Gospel according to Matthew and then I think also in, in Luke, where our Lord Jesus Christ says, well, the, um, if you sin, uh, against, you blaspheme against the Son, you'll be forgiven, but if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven, either in this life or in the next. Okay. And some people, um, the church has always understood um, uh, one we may wonder, well, how do I uh, combine this with the fact that that, um, that God is all merciful, is the father of the prodigal son, and but now he's now saying that like I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. 
that I will not be forgiven. And so one, you say, well, an unmerciful God that forgives everything is now telling me that there are some things he does not forgive. How do I combine it? Too? Well, but the mercy of God uh, is unlimited. That's because God is all merciful. But in order to attain that mercy, we need to repent. And repentance is necessary. God doesn't forgive if God cannot forgive rather if one is not um, is not sorry. The prodigal son, if he did not come back, the father could not express that forgiveness uh, without him coming back. So the church always understood that if one deliberately rejects God's mercy and remains obstinate in not repenting of his sins. This stubbornness or obstinacy is a sin against the Holy Spirit. It's not, so it's not a particular type of sin, but rather when one rejects, stubbornly rejects God's mercy and remains in not repenting of his sins. A person that like this child that closes his ears and says, well, uh, and one can do that in several ways, either by making fun of the sacrament of penance by not taking use, using the means to ask for forgiveness, by saying, well, by falling into the kind of false despair to say, well, what I've done is so great that God cannot forgive this sin, by uh, not by being careless about one spiritual life and never and just doing things and never bothering to ask for forgiveness. Uh, that all that are different forms of stubbornness, which precisely are sins against the Holy Spirit, and uh, which by which. In, at the end of the day, is um, not receiving God's mercy because I fail to ask for it. Now we'll look at the topic of temptations. And uh, what's a temptation? Right? The root of all sins lies in man's heart. Okay? Well, and there, as our Lord Jesus Christ will say, you know, that out of the heart of man come well, all the, we say, the temptation, fornication, etc. Uh, out of the man's heart, not from external things, but if there's no, if we don't consent, there's no sin. And many times these temptations come from within, uh, but they can also come from the world and from the devil. What do other temptations? Temptations are not sin. Rather, temptations try to lead one to sin. And a temptation is anything that leads me to sin. But they can never be so strong that they oblige one to sin. The words of St. Paul. I say that, that God will not allow us to be tempted more than we can bear. So that no one should ever say, well, that I had to commit this sin, that this was a necessary sin. No. And that God never allows one to be tempted more than uh, the obliging one to sin. And God always gives man, at each point, the grace to conquer any temptation. There are three primary causes of temptation. Um, and the first one are uh, the world. The world, not as God's creation, because uh, God created the world good, but um, because in this sense it is good, but rather the world, uh, when we put the world above that love of God and see it as an end in itself. Secondly is the devil. The devil who instigates sin but does not have the power to make us sin. Who suggests, like that devil that's suggesting to Omar Simpson here in this photo, um, who suggests in different ways, why don't you do this, why don't you do the other thing that is wrong? Uh, and then the third um, cause of temptation is the flesh, or concupiscence, that inclination to sin that we have within us uh, as an effect of original sin. At times it may be that excessive love of pleasure, that laziness, that desire to cut corners, um, that the flesh or concupiscence which inclines us to sin. Temptations also um, take place in three phases. In three phases. The first phase is what we we'll call suggestion, uh, which is that involuntary representation of something evil. Uh, maybe suggest to me that well, why don't you go and slap this person? Why don't you go to this website? And go and look at these uh, obscene pictures. Or why don't you maybe you see that your mother's post is open? Let me go and take some money. Why don't you take some money from the post? I'm sure that it will be there uh, and there will be some money inside it. Suggest you. Uh, which is the involuntary representation of something evil. The second stage is that non deliberate complacence. Uh, what, does, what do I mean by that? That is, a complacence is to take pleasure in something 
Uh, so, well, in this case, it's not deliberate. That maybe I think of when after like suggestion, almost immediately one thing. Well, what uh, we nice to take this money or we uh, the complacence of what I will find on the internet when I go to check this impure site or um, the complacence you may call this silly complacence of uh, of pleasure or feel looking at the face of this person after I slap the person. That is non deliberate complacence, which many times comes immediately after the suggestion, almost you say simultaneously. Yeah. But since it's non-deliberate, uh, uh, there's no sin yet in it. Yeah? Because it's like a natural consequence or a natural reaction uh, of that suggestion. Like when we think of something good, there's a certain non-deliberate pleasure we already feel when we think of that thing that we see as good. The problem, uh, the third stage, the third phase, and the final stage is, is consent, okay. uh, which is the problem, uh, which constitutes the true sin. Uh, that when the deliberate complacence, no, non deliberate complacence, sorry, there's no sin, uh, is when one realizing consents to it, then there's sin. And so, in the ascetical struggle, in our struggle for holiness, it's important uh, not to fall into thinking that well, when I think of something, I've already committed a sin. Uh, when I felt good thinking about it, when it's in my mind, I felt good, I committed a sin. Feeling is not consenting. And consenting is an act of the will uh, that accepts and that takes pleasure in that particular action. And it's only when one consents that there is true sin. And so, you know, that way, of course, at times maybe one is not representing sure, and maybe one can ask one's spiritual director or someone that one trusts. To clarify when we really have I really consented to this, or can also ask when one goes to confession. I'm not sure if I consented to this or not. And with that, we end this um, class on temptation. But we'll just end with a, a short video, not class on personal sin, sorry, not temptation. We we'll end with a short video that um, explains again, just to reinforce the ideas we transmitted, the difference between mortal and venial sin. May God bless us all. What are sins? Sins are thoughts, words, and deeds against the divine law. What is the divine law? It isn't an incredibly thick book with a gigantically long list of legal provisions, but rather, as Jesus says, the law consists in the love of God and love of our neighbor. If someone truly loves God and his neighbor, he fulfills the law. A sin, then, is an action that is against the love of God or the love of our neighbor. Now, there are sins that are completely against the love of God or neighbor and therefore destroy it. And then there are sins that only wound that love. In this way, we can differentiate between grave sins and lesser or venial sins. Grave sins are simply contrary to the love of God and neighbor. They completely attack that love. Idolatry, not keeping Sunday holy, murder, adultery, or theft are just a few examples of these. Whoever does these things knowingly and with free will commits what is called a grave or serious sin. Grave sins destroy the bond of love that unites us to God. We lose sanctifying grace by which we share in the divine life. And so, the loss of grace also means the loss of our supernatural life. That is why grave sins are also called mortal sins. Venial sins, like all sins, show a certain lack of putting things in the right order. They might be a little too much or a little too little in matters that aren't so serious. There might be misdirection, but they are not directed against the love of God or neighbor. What would be an example illustrating the difference? Well, lying is clearly and always a sin. And this sin would be grave if I deceive someone in a very important matter or cause him damage. For example, if I sell someone a great house for a lot of money, though I'm well aware that in reality it's a dump, that's aimed directly against the love of neighbor. If, on the other hand, without the intention to hurt someone, I tell another person that I like his cello playing, even though I don't like cellos, 
then this would normally be considered a venial sin. Venial sins, then, are less serious because they don't destroy the love of God and neighbor. But all the same, that does not make them good. They are still sins. They need to be avoided just like all other sins, even more so because of the fact that frequent venial sins more quickly lead us to fall into mortal sin. If, for example, I'm frequently creative with the truth in minor matters, then I will form a habit and I will soon find myself in a situation where I begin to lie in more important matters. So, there you have grave and venial sins. To conclude this episode, we can try to illustrate the effects these different sins have on us. This burning candle represents the light of grace illuminating our soul. It lets us see the path to God so that we can reach our goal safely. This is what it actually should look like in all of us all the time. Through venial sins, the flame begins to flicker. We can still see things, but a flickering flame doesn't shine as brightly anymore. And it's difficult to see everything clearly in such a light. Anyone who has tried to read something in the light of a flickering candle knows what I mean. Through mortal sin, the light goes out completely. We are in the dark and are no longer able to progress towards God until light is restored to us. Or here's the thing once again using a different example. Living the life of grace means eating healthy. You grow and thrive. Venial sins are like undigestible food or too much of something, both of which will give you a stomach ache. Grave sins, on the other hand, are like poison. The end. Game over. While with venial sins you can set matters right by acting rightly, with grave sins, you need help from outside. And this help comes to us from God in the form of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, or Confession. In Confession, to stick with the examples, we are resuscitated, or the light of grace is rekindled. 